Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mark Milwee at Trinity, Alabama, Mount View Baptist Church. Uh, we want to uh, continue our study today on Pathway uh, to Maturity. A and today we're going to talk about the very important subject of uh, obedience. Uh, God gave us his word not only to increase our knowledge about him, but also to change our lives. It's only as we apply his truth to our lives, as we obey the scriptures, that there will be any significant change uh, in our Christian walk. So the objective of our lesson today will be uh, to help us understand the importance of, ob of uh, the importance of being obedient to do uh, what God tells us uh, to do. So I'd like to begin uh, our discussion of this subject uh, today by uh, telling you the story of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is considered by many to be uh, the greatest uh, theologian of the 20th century. Uh, he was executed uh, during the last month of World War II in the Flossenburg concentration camp in Germany. He was hanged in, uh, for his participation in helping uh, 14 Jews escape uh, the Nazi atrocities in Germany and for his participation in helping to plan a failed uh, assassination attempt on the life of Adolf Hitler. He once explained his actions to his sister by saying this. He said, if I see a madman driving a car into a crowd of innocent bystanders, then I can't, as a Christian, simply wait for the catastrophe and then comfort the wounded and bury the dead. I must try to wrestle the steering wheel out of the hands of the driver. Now, whether you agree or disagree with his actions, you have to admire a man uh, with the courage to stand up uh, against one of the most uh, evil leaders the, the world has ever known. In fact, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have probably lived to a ripe old age had it not been for the fact that uh, he left his teaching post in New York in 1939 uh, to return to his native Germany to take a stand against the atrocities uh, taking place in his homeland. Well, I bring all this up uh, today uh, uh, because in his short life, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had a lot to say about the true meaning of discipleship. Uh, in his book, uh, Cost of Discipleship, uh, which I've uh, referenced uh, before, excellent book, it, it's become a Christian classic. Uh, anyway, uh, in his book, he uh, gives a quote that I want to begin with uh, tonight, one I've shared with you before. And if you watch very many of these lessons, you're going to see that I repeat some things. But uh, when I taught uh, in Russia, they had a saying over there. They said, a repetition is the mother of knowledge. And so we keep going over some of these things until we uh, remember them. But here's his famous quote. He says, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Uh, with these words, I believe Dietrich Bonhoeffer gives us the bottom line on the cost of discipleship. Obedience is the key. If you want to be a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have to be obedient to do what he says. Uh, but of course, this is very difficult for us uh, in the world we live in today, especially uh, here in America. Uh, we have uh, been stagnant, drilled into us from the time that we were children, uh, you know, to be ruggedly independent. And, you know, we're not going to let anybody tell us what to do. We're going to stand up against authority, you know, and all those things. Uh, we even see it right now with, the, you know, this stay-at-home order. I mean, some people are struggling so much with this right now because uh, they, they, you know, uh, feel like that somebody's telling them what to do. But the Bible clearly tells us, and you're going to see it today in our lesson, that obedience is the key uh, to growing in our walk uh, with Christ. Um, if you really believe, Bonhoeffer says, you're going to obey, and this obedience uh, demonstrates your belief. On the other hand, if you refuse to obey, this demonstrates your lack of belief because you can say all day long that you believe, but if you refuse to do what the Bible says then that shows your true uh, colors. So again, the famous quote, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient uh, believes. In Jerry Bridges' book, uh, The Pursuit of Holiness, he has a very interesting quote that I'd like to uh, start with uh, today. And I want you to really give some thought uh, to this quote. He says, it's time for us as Christians to face up to our responsibility for holiness. Too often we say that we are defeated by this or that sin. He continues, no, 
We're not defeated. We are simply disobedient. He says it might be well if we stopped uh, using uh, the terms victory and defeat to describe our progress in holiness. Rather, we should use the terms obedience and disobedience. I really like that because it gets to the heart of what we want to talk about uh, today. When Frank Sinatra died a few years ago, I, I heard that his signature song was, I Did It My Way. Uh, I even conducted a funeral service once uh, where they played that song. I, I guess the guy that died was proud of the fact that he did it his way. Well, this could have been the theme song for King Solomon in 1 Samuel 15. He's like so many in our world today who want to make up the rules as they go along. After being confronted by, uh, about his sin by Samuel, he says in verse 20 of 1 Samuel 15, I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission. I completely destroyed the Amalekites. But notice Samuel's answer in verses 22 to 23 of 1 Samuel 15. He says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fruit of, than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So God has a word for us uh, this morning, and that word is obedience. The clear teaching of this passage says to obey is better than sacrifice. So we can put on all kind of appearances as we come together to symbolically offer our burnt offerings and sacrifices when we come together at church. But God is much more concerned about what we do outside the walls of the church as what we do right here in front of each other. God knows our heart. And if this passage teaches us anything, it teaches that God loathes those who say one thing and then do another. There is no amount of justification, no amount of rationalization, no excuse that is good enough that will make up for our lack of obedience. God takes our sin very seriously. King Saul was not uh, obedient to do what God had told him to do. And as a result, it cost him the throne. So that's an Old Testament example. Uh, let me give you one now from the New Testament. In Romans chapter 2, beginning with verse 12, this is what Paul writes. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show uh, that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. The key to understanding this passage is found right there in verse 13. Again, it says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who are justified. Therefore, again, obedience is the key to being declared righteous in God's sight. Paul is showing the contrast between two groups of people, the Jews who received the law and the Jew Gentiles who were apart from the law. Although both groups have sinned, the basis for judgment is different, that the Gentiles would perish apart from the law and the Jews would be judged by the law. Paul is using this line of argument because the Jews thought they were safe since they had been given the law, but far from being safe, they would be judged more severely because of the knowledge they had received. Well, I believe a, a good case can be made that this passage also applies to those of us today who have been given so much knowledge and insight but we continue to ignore the clear teachings of God's Word. God is looking for obedience. Uh, look closely again at verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who are justified. Uh, J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrase of this passage, says, It is not familiarity with the law that justifies a man, but obedience to it. 
In fact, we could just substitute the word Bible there for the law, and it might make it even clearer to us. It's not familiarity with the Bible that justifies a man, but obedience to it. Uh, one of my all-time favorite uh, Christian books is this one right here, uh, Loving God uh, by Chuck Colson. It's an excellent uh, book. It's, uh, it's, well, I'm showing my age now. It's, it's been out quite a long time. <laughs> but uh, he talks a lot in that book about this subject of obedience. Uh, listen to what he says. He says, uh, that's where obedience comes in. For maturing faith, faith which deepens and grows as we live our Christian life, it's not just knowledge, but knowledge acted upon. It's not just belief, but belief lived out and practiced. And he then quotes uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer from The Cost of Discipleship, his famous quote, only he is, who believes is obedient, only he is obedient believes. And then he summarizes his thoughts on this subject by saying, Christianity must evoke from the believer the same response it drew from the first disciples, a passionate desire to obey and please God, a willingly entered into discipline that is the beginning of true discipleship. That is the beginning of loving God. And near the end of that book, uh, he says that love for God is spelled L-O-V-E. Excuse me. I don't know if you can hear it, but the tornado sirens just started going off, so that's uh, kind of got me a little flustered. <laughs> I may have to duck under the desk here in a minute. Uh, love for God is not spelled L-O-V-E. It is spelled O-B-E-Y. Obedience is the key to truly growing and maturing in your Christian life. Uh, let, let me put it this way. God doesn't really care about how much we know. God cares about what we do with what we know. Uh, the text we read just a moment ago said the Gentiles who did not receive the law do by nature the things required by the law. In other words, the law was written on their hearts and in their conscience. Some people worry themselves sick over how God will be able to judge those who've never heard the gospel or how can God judge those in the Old Testament before Christ? Uh, what basis, you know, is God going to use to judge them? Some even let this concern prevent them from believing in God. However, God does not judge the way that we judge. God's judgments are just. They're always right. They're based in truth. They're based on impartiality. They're based on obedience. So with this in mind, uh, let's look at uh, where Jesus uh, shares in Luke 6. Uh, in fact, I've discussed this passage before as well. Luke 6, beginning in verse 46. Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I'll show you what he's like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, a stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the storm broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So Jesus asked a simple question. Why do you call me... Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you. In other words, that Jesus is not really your Lord if you're not doing the things he tells you to do. So he says the wise man builds his house on the rock and he'll be able to weather the storms of life. In contrast, the foolish man has no intention of doing what the Bible says. He builds his house on the sand. His life and all he has is destroyed when the storms come. The wise man is the man who does what Jesus says even when it's difficult. He is obedient. He hears the word and he puts it into practice. We need to build our lives on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ and be obedient to do his will. Once again, we see that obedience is the key. Most Bible scholars believe that the book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, uh, the wisest man to ever live. Now, you might remember that early on in his reign, God asked him. God told him to ask for anything he wanted, and he would grant it to him. And he asked that God might give him the wisdom to govern the people and to be able to distinguish right from wrong. Well, God was so pleased with this request that he not only granted Solomon wisdom, but he also gave him unimaginable wealth and prosperity. 
Therefore, Solomon had the intelligence and the means to search for the meaning and purpose uh, in everything this life has to offer. The book of Ecclesiastes records how he does this. And he says over and over and over again that it's meaningless and a chasing after the wind. He goes out and he tries everything that this world has to offer. And then he comes to an interesting conclusion. It's found in the last two verses of that book. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning with verse 13. Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this whole duty of man, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So what's the conclusion? After trying everything this world has to offer, King Solomon says, here's the conclusion of all things. Here's the summary. Fear God and keep his commandments. In other words, uh, be in awe of God, worship God, give your allegiance to God, your loyalty to God, and Keep his commandments. In other words, do what God says. Obey his word. Live for him. So when it's all said and done, here is the way to find meaning and purpose in life according to the wisest man to ever live. Fear God, believe in God, and keep his commandments. Obey him. Do what he tells you to do. Well, why? Because someday we're going to have to give an account for our lives. And God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or bad. Therefore, honor God with your life, believe in him, and do what God tells you to do, obey him. This is the final conclusion of the wisest man to ever live. Great advice from a man who had the means and the intelligence to try everything this world has to offer. Fear God, keep his commandments. I find it very interesting that it's so similar to the Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote. Remember, he said, only he who believes is obedient. Only he who is obedient believes. We could change that slightly and say, only he who fears God keeps his commandments, and only he who keeps his commandments fears God. So again, we see that obedience is the key to living the life God expects of his followers. In fact, Jesus says uh, that we show our love for God by our obedience. In John 14, 21, Jesus says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So we show our love for God by keeping his commandments, by doing what he tells us to do, by obeying his word. And as we do this, we demonstrate our love for him. And as a result of our obedience, the Bible says we will be loved by the Father uh, because we love his one and only Son. Jesus will also manifest himself to us. His love is manifest to us through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. I can say this with confidence because of what uh, Jesus says next. Uh, John fourteen twenty two. 22. Uh, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Well, Judas, not Iscariot, that was the disciple known as Thaddeus. So Thaddeus asked a question. He says, Lord, how is it you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? He didn't really understand how all this was going to work. And, and I'm glad he asked this question because it gives Jesus another uh, ex- opportunity uh, to clarify what he means by this. So Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So let's break that down and look carefully at what he said there. He says, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. So again, we show our love by our obedience. And my Father will love him. Uh, The Father will love us because we're showing love to the Son by being obedient. Now look very carefully at the end of verse 23, where Jesus says, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Well, who's that? Who's the we? Jesus referring. I believe Jesus is referring there to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The word for home is the same word that's used back up in verse 2. It means dwelling place or abode. Jesus is saying that if we'll show our love for him by our obedience, then he and the Father will make their home or take up residence in our life. They do this through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. 
So as we show our love by our obedience, when we obey and do the things that God tells us to do, then we have the love of the Father residing in our life through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. In other words, I show my love for God by my obedience. This is exactly what God's Word says in two different uh, passages. In 1 John 2, 4, uh, whoever says, I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So that's the negative. But here's the positive, 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Uh, Chuck Colson explains how this works in his book, A Dangerous Grace. He tells the story about sitting in uh, the chapel of the Delaware State uh, Prison on a Sunday morning uh, waiting to preach. He said, my mind uh, drifted back to scholarships and honors earned, cases argued and won, the great decisions made in lofty government offices. My life had been the perfect success story, the great American dream fulfilled. But all at once I realized it was not my success that God had used to enable me to help those in prison or in hundreds of others like it. My life of success was not what made this morning so glorious. All my achievements meant nothing in God's economy. No, the real legacy of my life was my biggest failure. He says, I was an ex-convict. And those of you who are old enough to know, you know, he was involved in the Watergate scandal and went to prison. And was while in prison, he became a Christian. And then he started prison fellowship and the rest is history. But anyway, he, he goes on and says, my greatest humiliation being sent to prison was the beginning of of God's greatest use of my life, he chose the one experience in which I could not glory for his glory. He then continues by saying, confronted with the staggering truth, I understood with a jolt that I had been looking at life backward. But now I could see. Only when I lost everything that I thought made Chuck Colson a great guy had I found the true self God intended me to be and the true purpose of my life. And, of course, his life story is a beautiful story uh, about how God's grace can change a life. God, told, uh, Chuck, God took Chuck Colson's greatest failure and created Prison Fellowship, a, a ministry that continues to minister to men and women all around the world in prison, even today after his death. This is what God can do through a life that is fully committed and obedient to him. He summarizes all that by saying, it's not what we do that matters, but what a sovereign God chooses to do through us. God doesn't want our success. He wants us. Let me repeat that. God doesn't want our success. He wants us. He doesn't demand our achievements. He demands our obedience. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of paradox where through the ugly defeat of a cross, a holy God is utterly glorified. Victory comes through defeat, healing through brokenness, finding self through losing self. And you know what? He's absolutely right. God doesn't want your successes. He wants you. God isn't overly concerned with your achievements. He wants your obedience. In fact, God demands obedience. Obedience is the key to growing in Christ. He has a chapter in his book, Loving God, entitled The Everyday Business of Holiness. I'd like to end with it today. He says, holiness is the everyday business of every Christian. Holiness is obeying God, loving one another as he loved us. Holiness is obeying God, even when it's against our own interest. Holiness is obeying God. Sharing his love even when it's inconvenient. Holiness is obeying God, finding ways to help those in need. Holiness is obeying God. Or as Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, only he who believes is obedient. Only he who is obedient believes. Thank you for watching today. God bless you.